Hi, <laughs> it's so lovely to see you all. This is an incredibly impressive audience. Thank you, Grant, for the invitation to speak here, and thank you, Nikki, for that really warm introduction. It's very, very kind. So let's get this started properly. I want to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands that I'm standing on. I acknowledge their continued connection to the lands and the waters of this really beautiful area, and also acknowledge that their sovereignty was never ceded. It's a really great honour to be here and to be able to share a story with you, but to also know that that is just one story in the hundreds of thousands that must have been told in this area by the banks of the Yarra River for over 60,000 years. And I just find that thought really, really humbling. And with that, I pay my respects to elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all First Nations people that are here with us today. <laughs> I love the water uh, and I love swimming. And I used to swim daily at the local YMCA. And one morning I was splitting a lane with this other swimmer who had this really unique way of swimming that was just really mesmerizing. And he had this way of just being able to cut through the water and just glide through it with very little movement and energy. And I was really struck by this because it looked like someone was at the other end of the pool pulling him by rope. And um, when he popped up next to me, I just sort of turned to him and I said, hey, I don't mean to break your flow, but I was just watching your form as you cut through the water. What's your secret? And he took his goggles off and he spent a few minutes talking to me about it. And, and his technique is really interesting. So, you know, when you take your hand and you just sort of move it gently through water, it kind of takes very little effort, right? But as you start moving faster and faster, that water feels like it's hardening and starts to approach something like concrete. And he described to me that when you look at the top Olympic athletes, when they're swimming, they're moving so aggressively through the water that 90% of their energy is going into tackling resistance. And his method of swimming was almost an inversion of that, which is it was about having a different relationship with water where you could flow through, understand how the water was moving around your body, because the intent was to minimize resistance and drag. So it's almost like a mindfulness practice in the water and in the pool. And I just really love this idea. And I was both inspired and despondent at the same time, because I sort of turned to him and I said, like, wow, 90% of energy going into tackling resistance. When I leave here, that's what my job feels like every day. And so, and I say that because uh, I describe my work as taking design to where it isn't, and I'm really deeply intrigued by the kinds of challenges that affect large population sizes. And so this has led to engagements and work with the World Bank, um, where I was there for several years, um, and UN agencies before that, and now currently in state government. And because these are the organizations that are tasked with attending to the really large social, economic, and environmental challenges of our day. And so one of the things that I've always noticed, and I don't think it'll be any surprise to anyone here, is that these institutions are also quite large themselves, quite complex, and they've grown, but I'd say they've grown a lot in bureaucracy as well. And what we really need them to do is be nimble and agile and creative in order to tackle a lot of the contemporary challenges that we're faced with. And as a designer working in these places, I always found that I would feel that resistance, just like the swimmers, when you're kind of pushing up against the bureaucracy and the amount of energy that would go into kind of trying to develop workarounds. So what I thought I'd share with you today is my experience of trying to embed design and scaling design practice within government. And I'd like to do that in a way that connects back to the three themes of this conference. So uh, design leadership, design scale, and design impact. And I see all of those themes as the outcomes of when design is able to demonstrate disproportional influence. So a couple of years ago, just up the road um, at the Service Design Now conference, I gave a talk that was focused on the subject of scale and scalability. 
And at the time, I was speaking about the enormous social and environmental challenges that we're facing. And this sobering image behind me is um, showing how since the 1950s, all these trends have started accelerating in completely unsustainable ways. And as those challenges continue to accelerate, our linear solutions just won't be enough. And so we need to design solutions that keep up with or get ahead of the growth rate and exponential curve that these challenges are on. So the last two years, I think we've all become pretty familiar with the challenge that operates at an exponential curve when we think about the infection rates of COVID and all of our collective efforts that we put in to try and get out in front of it and try and flatten that curve. So the question that I put forward back then was how do we practice design with an underlying scalable architecture to deliver exponential impact? And I also presented a couple of abstract ideas of how I thought we could do that. Now I feel having put those ideas out there, I should be held accountable uh, to them. So today what I'd like to do is share with you a story of how we, we attempted to answer that question within the context of government. And I'll show you the outcome, which didn't quite go the way that we thought it would, um, which I'll return to later. Um, I think the other thing is, it's fairly safe to say that government is a bit of a black box. It's really opaque. Um, so let me take a minute just to set the context for you. <clears throat> so what is government? I think Abraham Lincoln put it really elegantly when he said, the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done, but cannot do at all or cannot so well do for themselves in their separate and individual capacities. And the fact that individuals can't do, their own, do these things on their own or at all tells us that the problems are really quite hairy and complex that government is there to attend to. So there are no real quick fixes. And just as an addition, what he's talking about there, and what I'm going to present on, is government, not politics, right? Which is something altogether different. So most citizens generally see government as a singular organisation. And we have these three levels um, within government, local, state and federal, all connected, but with very different responsibilities. So local government takes care of things like your garbage collection and maintaining your local playgrounds. And federal on the other end, We'll take care of things like tax collection and defense and matters to do with other countries. And state handles a lot of the services that you interact with at a daily level. So this is things like public education or healthcare and public transport. And so if we zoom into Victoria in the middle, the public sector is structured this way. Over there is the broader public sector and there's two layers to it. So there is the public service and that has nine departments and they all collectively oversee over 300 public entities and frontline agencies that citizens interact with every day. So these are things like your schools, your clinics, your galleries, your parks. So this auditorium that we're sitting in is part of Fed Square, which is a public entity. And just beyond here on the other side of the Yarra is the Botanical Gardens, which is also another public entity. And so, Government is kind of all around us, but we generally don't tend to notice because it's kind of hiding in plain sight. And the Victorian government is the largest employer in the state, and the Victorian public sector equates to 345,000 people. So that's one out of every 10 jobs. And that's a group of people that are looking after the 6.7 million Victorians as everyone lives, works and plays here. So I joined the public service um, about maybe three years ago. And I think one of the things I noticed was being on the outside would allow me to work on very discrete projects um, that were sort of like broken up and then farmed out. But in terms of looking at more of the systems level problems and working at a strategic level, really needed to be on the inside of government to do that. And um, so I became part of this team in Department of Premier and Cabinet these are the wonderful people that I get to work with every day. I love my crew. They're just so great. Um, and I've included former team members here because these are the people that I cross paths with 
you know, I really want to acknowledge their contribution to a lot of the successes we've had. So we do two primary things. Um, the first is capability building. And what we're trying to do is increase the digital and design literacy within the broader public sector. I just want to say that we're not trying to convert public servants into designers. Frankly, that would be irresponsible, right? Setting them up with just a little bit of information to take on huge complex challenges is almost a recipe for disaster. But what we are trying to do is get them to understand and appreciate design in a way that they can collaborate with seasoned designers. And the second thing that we do is that we partner with teams across government and the public sector to execute projects together. So we develop new policies, new programs, new services, all through a human-centered design practice. And ultimately, our goal for our team is to elevate the significance, impact, and sustainability of design within government. But as we work towards that, <laughs> there are three really intriguing challenges that we have to always overcome or work around. And so I'm just going to go through them. And the first is operating in a double-sided market. So design operates differently in the public sector to the private sector. So in the private sector, you get a model like this. You have this exchange that takes place between the buyer and the seller. So you've got the, the seller who passes on the product or service, and then the customer purchases that um, in exchange for funds. Right? Straightforward supply and demand, we do this every day. Uh, but interestingly, the person who pays for the service is the person who receives the service. In the public sector, you never get less than three parties because the person who receives the service is not the person paying for the service. Right? So what this means is that there's usually a funder, which is often a department or a minister on this side, and then there is the service provider in the middle, so all the government agencies, things like Vic Roads or clinics or um, legal offices, and then you've got the citizen on the far end who is the recipient of that service. So who's the customer? Well, the customer is the person who pays for the service, not the person who receives the service, which means the minister is the true customer of that, um, is the true customer of the service, and the citizen is the beneficiary of the service. And that means the minister is funding a service team to basically work around a certain set of priorities, which are usually the form of policies. And what we often do is work with those service teams to think, how do we work within the scope of that policy to then maximize the output and outcome for the community? And I describe this as a double-sided market because any government service basically has to satisfy the interests of both sides in order to fully succeed and survive. So when we're doing the work on this side, this is where the service design team, we get involved. And on the right-hand side, we do a lot of the traditional service design work, employing a lot of tactical human-centered design tools uh, with the community. But on the other side uh, is a different kind of challenge. And so this is where we do a lot of strategic and systems design work. And the left-hand side is the part that's often hidden from view. You don't get to see it as a citizen because it's all contained within the context of government. But it's the part that I really wanted to share with you and talk about because this is where we start to create systems change. And to avoid spending 90% of our energy in just countering the resistance of bureaucracy, we needed to always find a strategic way through it. And so this arrangement might seem sort of trivial but it's not because it changes the whole paradigm of how you undertake design. And neglecting this side is really problematic because if you just focus on this side, I mean, to refer to an earlier presentation, it would be the equivalent of winning the battle but then losing the war. So the second challenge that we confront is the lifespan of uh, design units within government. Um, I'm sure you'll understand that it's not the most creatively favorable uh, environment. And when you look at the history of design labs and innovation labs that get established inside of government, the vast majority of them 
close down prematurely because they only last between three to five years or three to four years more accurately. So in other words, they last one government term or an election cycle. And the most famous and successful was MindLab in Denmark, and that only had an 11-year run. So when I started on the team, I said to my executives, um, our goal is to get to 12 years. And that wasn't intended to sound competitive, it was just an acknowledgement that the really entrenched social challenges were going to take some time to solve. And we couldn't do that overnight, and we needed a plan for our own sustainability to make sure that we could stick around long enough to both tackle the big ticket issues that were out there in the community, but also create the systems change by changing the processes internally within government and to prove that design should be a permanent and core practice of government and a capability of the public sector. So the problem was that we only had four years of funding and we were already into our third year. And so a condition of our funding, because as you know, nobody gives you money for free, that we had to prove a return. And that was, we had to get 20 government entities a year to adopt a human-centered design practice into their work. And those targets, as well as our performance, gets published annually to the public so that the public can see if the dollars are being spent wisely. No pressure. So, and then we had the third challenge, and that was getting the departments to adopt design into their practice. And so we're housed within the Department of Premier and Cabinet, which is what's known as a central agency. So it's the one that talks to all the other departments, and it mostly provides a lot of recommendation and coordination through the former policies. And you'd think, well, great, let's just use our authority to kind of mandate that all departments and agencies use human-centered design. It would be pretty easy. But I'm sure you can appreciate that enforcing something like that wouldn't work as we'll have set ourselves up for a very combative relationship with the departments and agencies. And furthermore, it's just really not in the spirit of human-centered design. So it'd be working against our own intent. And we didn't really have time to be lobbying the departments and agencies because that would have just taken forever. And we needed to make a really compelling argument and an approach so that they would want to adopt it. So we faced this triple threat of a double-sided market, overcoming the short lifespan of most design labs, and working how to get departments and their agencies to adopt human-centered design to, into their work when it was easier for them not to. And so I'll show you how we went through about addressing them one at a time, and I'll start with the last one first. So a common idea in network theories um, shows us how systems evolve from centralized to decentralized to distributed. So an example of this might be in the context of, say, technology or communication and how that's evolved. So let's take the example of like a radio station. There was once a time where there was a central radio station that broadcast the same message out to all of the people that were basically receiving that information. And that was the centralized network. And then a decentralized network is a little bit like thinking of sort of syndicated radio or local radio stations, where they were taking on more local concerns. And then in the internet era and the dis with the distributed network, uh, this is where social media has come in to take um, a greater stake of that communication, where all of us are effectively broadcasters and consumers at the same time. And so then that intent is sort of distributed widely and we get to express even our personal point of views and have more agency in the content. So this abstract diagram is also quite useful for understanding how government works because we can think of departments as like these blue circles and then the teams or individuals um, that make up the public sector as the green. And so as a central department like the one we're in, we can mandate to all other departments to, do, to take on human-centered design. In the second one, in the decentralized approach, we, we become, I guess, an equal player amongst all other departments. 
and they all have a choice as to whether they opt in or not, and you're spending more time doing a lot of the sort of coordination effort. But the problem in government uh, is that departments and agencies get created, reconfigured, and dismantled quite often. In fact, it happens after every election, right? It's not something that's widely known, but it's called, there's a name for it, it's called the machinery of government. And so that means all of our efforts that we would have spent working department by department would have been completely undone potentially by the next election. So they, departments just aren't as permanent as we think. However, what is more permanent is the career public servant who will be in the service for a decade or two. And they move between departments and agencies. So the distributed network is probably more compelling for us and we can think of each of those nodes in green as an individual public servant. And if we get them to understand and adopt design, then with enough time, they'll help diffuse design practice throughout the public sector as they move from department to department and from agency to agency, applying it to their work and their projects. Um, Ray Kroc, who was the founder of McDonald's, had a saying, which is, look after the customer and the business will take care of itself. And for us, it was something similar, which is look after the public servant and the systems change will take care of itself. But there are 345,000 public servants and we're a team of five, so I didn't know how we were gonna reach them all. Um, so what could we do? We needed to design a scalable solution. And to reach those numbers, we had to think about the problem differently. So I gave this talk a couple of years ago and in that talk, the idea that I put forward, one of them was um, that we should add a zero to the end of what our intended scale of impact is. So rather than going for 20 government entities a year, what would it look like if we looked, tried to get 200 government entities a year? I'm glad to be part of a really impact-driven team, so we became a little bit more audacious than that. And we set ourselves a goal of said, Okay, let's say in five years time, we want our fingerprints on 5,000 projects a year coming out of government. What would that look like? And how would we do that? And in order to get there, what it does is that it changes your thinking because you're forced to embed economies of scale into a process and design and develop an underlying scalable architecture and a strategy based on exponential growth. So, we would do that with a mix of resources and tools, some advisory work, and then set of projects. So the resources and tools would carry a lot of the load, right? So, and it would go on this exponential curve in terms of reach. So these were really low, um, low touch, but high frequency. So that means we'd create the product once, and we'd create it well, and then we would deploy it thousands of times. The second was advisory where we would come in and they were doing the heavy lifting, our partnership teams, but we were just there as a design coach and a critical friend just to help them along. And then the third was technical assistance where these were like our trophy projects. We'd be really selective about them. Think about which of these will really demonstrate the full value of what design can bring to the public sector. And we choose them strategically to build up a, a key portfolio of trophy projects and then we'd go after those. And so we had to use our resources and energy effectively. So we built two key resources. The first was the human-centered design put, uh, playbook. There's a ton of free available playbooks out there. But what we noticed was that none of them really looked at it in terms of the interests of a public sector or the public servant. A lot of them are quite agnostic and really high level and abstract. So we created one that was just about having the public servant as the primary reader. And the second thing that we created was, well, we realized you can create the playbook. We didn't really subscribe to the field of dreams approach of like build it and they will come. Um, old Kevin, you know, Costner reference, uh, forget it. Anyway, um, so, but the point being is that just putting something out there isn't enough. So what we needed to do was also have the second part, which is follow on with a training, where we train them in the process just to give them, stretch their muscles and get, give them the experience of working with human-centered design. 
And so that would lead to greater uptake. And, um, and the scalability came from developing the product, then the training, and then that would lead to the projects as well. So in the last 20 months, we've trained over 700 public servants from all these different departments and agencies. And when I, we went back to report on our um, performance um, to Treasury, this is when we started to implement the new strategy. So we had 20 government entities, we hit 31. Last year we hit 74, and this year we're on track to hit about 110 conservatively. And that's the exponential growth curve that I was talking about earlier. And so what we were able to do there on both the training and with the um, published targets was to show the quant we were able to play the quantity game. But really, that's not enough. You've got to play the quality game as well. And last year at the Premier's Design Award, um, we were shortlisted for the uh, strategic design category. And this year, two former team members here, and one of them is here in the audience too, Jasmine, and Sophie um, won the award for service design for a project that they produced. So what we were able to demonstrate was just that the methodology for human-centered design and embedding it into government, and also the outputs that we were producing through that process and delivering better products into government um, were both being recognized by our peers in the design community. And it was for these reasons that we were able to demonstrate um, as the amount of money that was saved by government and by taxpayers in cost avoidance. We went through and we were able to realize that for every dollar that was spent on us in terms of funding, save $2.33 elsewhere. And those sorts of numbers are what Treasury are really interested in to work out if they're making the right kind of investment or not. And as a result, because last year, just as our funding was about to conclude at the end of those four years, we were refunded for another four years. And that was in a really highly competitive funding environment where most of the effort was going to direct COVID response. And we were there talking about why design still matters within the public sector. And so I guess the key thing there was we also now, given that we've got eight years of funding and a few more years of runway, um, we've already outlived the majority of design labs historically around the world. And the, our intent is to think about how we start to create, step it up a little bit further and think about new policy reforms, um, new org design, program design and service delivery with these coming years. And then our next goal is to think well beyond 12 years and for us to become a permanent fixture within government. And that was how we solved the double-sided market problem. But this is the bit that where I wanted to get to, because that's not even the, the whole story. When we reconnected back months later with the public servants that we trained, and we asked them, so how is the design process? How is that going? How has it changed your work? And we were really expecting them to tell us about little technical things that they were running into their projects and give them advice. But they told us something that we didn't expect. And they said it provided them with a sense of hope of what they were able to achieve in government. And that detail, hope, was so illuminating. Because firstly, it told us it wasn't just us as designers and creatives working in a bureaucratic environment that were feeling this 90% of our energy going into tackling resistance. It was lawyers, it was health professionals, it was program managers. They were all dealing with this issue of resistance in tackling the bureaucracy. And the second thing that we learned is that we were training them in very tactical design skills. But what it really changed and the impact that it had was that it heightened their motivation to do their work. Because over the last two years, the public sector has really just been pushed into hyperdrive. Like, just to give you an example, in one department, they serviced more than 2.3 million, million grant payments and it provided very critical support to businesses and individuals that were impacted by COVID. Now, the scale of the grant programs that was delivered in that one final, final, sorry, financial year represented 450 years worth of pre-COVID grant delivery, all stacked up in one year. 
And that's how intense things are, and that's just one story out of many across the public sector. And the public servants showed up, quietly did the work, and did what was needed to, to make sure that the community was served. And I want to return to Lincoln here, because for Lincoln, as a person, it's worth noting that his work weighed really heavily upon him. He suffered from severe depression, he agonized over decisions, and he was very emotionally invested in the work of governing. And yet, he's also regarded as the greatest president the US has ever had. So governing simply wasn't about administrative tasks, it was emotional labor. And governing in that manner, I see that spirit in all of the dedicated public servants that I have the pleasure of working with. They are highly talented people and they could work anywhere, but they choose to be in the public service because what they want to do is undertake their work with a sense of purpose and to improve the lives of others. And for them, their work isn't a job, it's really a calling. And design allowed them to operate in a way that aligned to their intrinsic values and intrinsic interests. And honestly, after an intense two years of the pandemic that left a lot of public servants burnt out and spiritually exhausted, I'm not sure how our work could have had a greater sense of impact than providing with a sense of optimism and hope. And this brings me to the subject of leadership. I really love this quote. We often talk about design and how we need to be holding these executive roles to advocate for design and make it more, make it more meaningful. And I'm not really sure about that because I think what's being described there is authority, not leadership. And I think these two things get confused for each other a lot. Leadership is an action, not a title. And I would go so far as to say that there is no such thing as a leader. There are only acts of leadership in this world. Because leadership is taking action when you know that change is necessary. And if you don't have authority, paradoxically, you are more likely to notice opportunities for change and opportunities to demonstrate an act of leadership. Because those in authority either aren't aware of what needs to be changed or don't want to know that things need to be changed. And this is especially important for designers because designers are just wired differently. What designers I find love the most is a meaningful challenge. And you have this eye and gut instinct for noticing when things don't look or feel right. And more than that, you have this ability to exercise creativity and to show how things could be and along the way, bring beauty into the world. So I don't really know anyone more primed to demonstrate an act of leadership than, than a designer. And given the economic, social, environmental challenges today, I really can't think of a better time to be a designer. And so at this next conference a year from now, I hope to be sitting where you are and I hope to see you standing where I am, talking about how you noticed a moment where change was necessary and the action you took around it. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been great, thank you.